Um, good morning. Thank you all for being here. Um, I called my presentation Letting Go um, because I'm trying to give control of classroom operations to my fourth graders. Um, so this goes along perfectly with what Corey and Courtney were just presenting about. Um, and so this is really a journey that we are all on together. Um, so I want to introduce our cast of characters. <laughs> and as you can see, they really are characters. I don't know about other grades, but fourth graders are like, they won't take a serious picture if you don't promise them the goofy one. Um, so here's the goofy one. So in the classroom every day, it's me, um, a wonderful pair of professional who works one-on-one -on -one with um, one of my students, and 16 9 and 10 year old learners. And at the beginning of the year, they gave themselves the name, team name, the Dumont Stars. And we really do use that name. Um, and so there they are. And so our story begins um, with my belief that fourth graders need to feel ownership over their classroom and their learning to get the most out of school. It's really the foundation for this. Um, my goal is that the class will run everything for an entire day. Um, and I won't say a word to them. And we'll call it a silent day. And um, my plan is that I will gradually release responsibility for the running of the classroom to the students and promote self-efficacy. Um, and this really came about um, through MGI in June. We talked a lot about identity and self-efficacy and how important it is for students to feel that ownership and feel that they can succeed. And really that's what self-efficacy is, is the belief that you can succeed. And so I, and the other inspiration was the book Learn Like a Pirate. If you haven't read it, it's a fantastic book. I highly recommend it. Um, Paul Solaris talks about his own classroom and his experience releasing responsibility and also describes Silent Day. And as soon as I read it, I was like, oh, I can do this. With these fourth graders, I hear they're gonna be a really good group. We're gonna try to do this. So um, that was our plan, was that gradually releasing responsibility. I was hoping to show an increase in their self-efficacy and their passion ownership. Um, so, oops, not too many. Um, to put the plan into action, I wrote up a, a list of routines and rituals that they need to do every day. You know, MGI, you're sitting out all the time to think, and you come up with the best laid plans, you know, and then introduce it on this day, day one, August 28th. Okay, we're gonna be doing this, this, and this, okay. Um, and these are the days they're going to be able to do it on their own or self-directed, and this is how we're gonna know that they're doing it. Um, of course, at MGI, everything seems all very rosy and wonderful, and <laughs> most of this happened to, um, similar to what it says here. The red indicates things that we just took out. They just, it wasn't working for us. Blue was, you know, something that we had to change because, again, it didn't go quite as expected. And yellow is something, well, we missed our date. Mr. Charlie, we're still working on it, and that's okay. And this isn't the whole list, this is just a snapshot of it. But it was, you know, going through and just seeing, well, what do we have to do? What can we change based on what we need? Yes. Um, the other part of this was to introduce self-efficacy. This was um, new language. It's not something that they've ever heard. And so we did that through um, first a, a self-assessment, and all they had to do was fill in statements, the ones that Chris Stevenson has developed and has used at MGI. And you'll see that on the next slide, um, what those statements are. So they did that before we even started talking about self-efficacy of what is that and what does that mean. They just filled in statements, I belong to and get along with. Okay, you know, I'm aware of what's going on. Where? Um, so they were just really thinking about their own identity at that point. And we also read the book, The First Rule of Punk, which I learned about at MGI at a book club, which it's an amazing book. We ended up Skyping with the author, C. C. Perez. It was just an amazing experience all around. So the reason we use this book is because the main character, Malu, is, you know, talking about her identity and trying to figure out who she is. And so we looked at self-efficacy through her lens. And, oh, I forgot to bring out my little zines. But we also made zines, and I have to get my zines. Excuse me for a second, because if you've never seen a zine, they are just about the cutest little things. Um, so they are many magazines, and so one of them is a model based on Malou and her own, her self-efficacies. Um, and so talked about hers, and then we you know, kind of matched them up to the model. Um, and then I made one for myself as a model, and because I felt 
felt if they were letting me know about them, I was going to let my, them know about me. And so this is my self-efficacy zine that they use both as a model and as a way to get to know me. And so there's a picture of them all working diligently to cut out words and letters that represent them to use in their own little self-efficacy zines. And they love making zines. If, um, once we started, there were zines everywhere all the time for everything. Just as a warning if anybody decides to do that. <laughs> Um, so this is the, um, these are some of the results from the first self-efficacy um, self-assessment that they did. And as you can see, they just had to fill in, um, finish those phrases. A lot of them are about the families and sports and math comes up a lot as far as things they need to get better at and how they're going to do that. And this is exactly what they wrote. So you might notice the pinch my nose as the thing they want to get better at. But you know what? They're fourth graders and got them. Um, so in this first time, it was really good to see that most of them could write something. We did have an I don't know, we had you know, some pretty interesting things. So they are feeling that they can be successful in some ways. We don't see a lot of school. This was like the third day of school, so not surprising that they're not yet feeling that they're successful at school. Um, and then in the follow-up though, we see a lot more mention of the classroom environment, friends at school, things that are happening in um, the classroom that they feel that they um, are having a higher level of self-efficacy in the classroom. And yes, one student, um, bless her soul, did write, I take care of Mrs. Dumont. Um, <laughs> it's a little bit wrong, but you know what? Um, so they're clear, very clearly feeling a strong connection with the classroom environment, their friends, and what we're doing at school. And so after four months, that's exactly what I was hoping to see. Um, the other way that um, they're taking ownership is that everyone in the class is entitled to get the group's attention pretty much any time long as it's worthwhile. We're working on that right now. They, they really love that chime. They love clapping. Um, they love getting the group's attention for things that sometimes we have to say, now did the whole group really need the, your attention? But we do that privately. It's not like, hey, you didn't need everybody's attention. But I think it's really important for them to know that their voices are powerful that theirs are just as important as mine. And so if they need the class's attention, they are welcome to get it. Um, and like I said, they use it. They use it a lot, um, sometimes more successfully than others, but they're, they're doing it. Um, the other way that they've taken ownership, and I gave you a little, because um, we came up with classroom jobs. And the first round, they got to get any idea they wanted. Nothing was thrown out. So we have things like pillow patroller, you know, because we have pillows in the classroom, like somebody should make sure those are picked up. We need a pillow patroller. Um, and so we had some really fun ideas. And so they did a survey where every idea was put in that survey and they could say yes or no. I want it or I don't. Um, this is an example of one of the results. So anything that got more than 50% of the vote was an automatic to go in the final list. Anything that got less than 50% of the vote was not on the final. And those that got 50% were um, put aside to be talked about as a whole group. And so we voted, some of them stayed, some of them went, Pillow Patroller didn't make the cut. <laughs> but phone answerer did because, oh my gosh, do they love answering the phone in the class. That's another responsibility that they are welcome to have. Most classes I don't think do that, let the student pick up the phone and say, hello, this is Dumont's room, student speaking. Um, but it's, I think it's really important they love that job. Um, so our final jobs, and I just do want to draw attention to one final job, because I think that um, it's important to show, maybe we can, no, I can't. Okay, that's okay, I can just talk about it. So one of the jobs, um, they also came up with expectations for each of these jobs. There's a job description so that they know exactly what they're supposed to do. And that came from them, I just typed. So one of the jobs is volcano monitor. And I'm pretty sure that no other classroom ever has had a volcano monitor. But we read the book, um, My Mouth is a Volcano, and they recognized in themselves that they have a lot of kids to interrupt and erupt like a volcano. So they decided that one person should be in charge of letting those people know that they're being a volcano. So they use a little bee sign. Or one student actually made a little volcano that says, I am a volcano. And a student can be a volcano. Um, and they take that very seriously. And the other kids respond to it really well because they know that they've chosen to have that person as a volcano monitor. And so I think if I had gone in there with the 
jobs already created, which I've done in the past, that would not have made the cut, and it wouldn't represent what they thought they needed. And I think that's been a really important lesson this year. You know, I don't always know what they need, and they know better than I do. So I just really love that job. Um, something else that they are um, helping me out with this year, taking responsibility for, is time management. So they have two blocks in the week, goal time and passion time, that are completely student-led, student-directed. They've decided what their SMART goal is. They've decided how they're going to reach that SMART goal. They are tracking their progress toward it. They come to me and tell me, Mrs. Dumont, I think I've reached my goal. And I say, okay, what's your evidence? And they will show me either um, spelling words that they've spelled all correctly, you know, that they've done with a partner. Um, or they show me a math journal where they've written beautifully, you know, because their goal is writing neatly so others can read it. And so that's really up to them. They have a goal partner who's working on something similar and they help each other out. Um, and passion time is a time where they do a project that's really their passion. I have, <laughs> I have projects ranging from World War One to um, makeup. And if it is used, you know, made with natural products versus synthetic products. So it's really it's who they are and it's something that they're really interested in and they really look forward to those two times, goal time and passion time. Um, the TBD blocks are just chunks of time where I'm like, I'm not sure. What do we want to do at this time? What do we need to do to be successful? Um, how should we use this time? And they'll say, oh, I think we should use it to finish up that ELA lesson that we didn't finish the other day. Or can we use it for math menu time? So it's really up to them how we use it. And I think the power of their voices really came through in this last item. Um, one day we had to finish ELA in the afternoon. We just didn't finish it, and it was one of those days, and we were like, happy to And so we did it, and they said, this is too much. Can we do this in the afternoon all the time? Can we always have ELA in the afternoon? And I said, well, why? They said, well, you know, after recess and lunch, we're a lot more settled down than we are before um, recess and lunch. We're a lot more squirrely, and integrated studies is like a time where we get to move around more. Okay, so we put it to a vote, and they all voted to do um, that change. And so now we do the LA afternoons. And again, it's not something that I would have thought of, and there was a perfectly valid reason, and they were able to explain it. And I just thought that was really um, a highlight for me to know that they realize that their voices are as powerful as they are. They can change this, you know. So I think that was really important. Um, so tracking progress. This is how we do it through self-assessments. Um, we try to we try to do it monthly. Um, best laid plans. But so really, what we're looking for is changes over time. So in the next few slides, you'll get to see some results. And I'll go through them rather quickly um, because really, what we're looking for again are the trends. So you'll see some things that jump out. And the data set is small, and it's comparing one month to the next. So we're kind of just looking for those trends. Um, so the right side indicates the ones that they feel like they're do they've improved on. The left side, kind of we're slipping backwards a little bit. Um, so you can kind of see morning they're feeling pretty good, except for that for getting their materials, and we'll get to that. Um, next one, this these changes again aren't that big, but again respectfully listening to each other. That's where that volcano monitor really comes in handy. Um, a lot of these are morning academic time. Their transitions and things are becoming loud and slow, as you'll see teachers feel the same. These are really, because the scale is so small, this looks big, but really these are about zero. And then that one really jumps out, right? The yeah. large negative, um, not cleaning out their cubbies. Well, again, that goes along with the observations that we've made as teachers, um, where they're forgetting their morning materials and they'll, they'll be not playing like, oh no, I don't have my math journal, I don't have a pencil, oh, okay. Learning sport. Um, transitions, loud and slow, and when they feel rushed at the end of the day, they forget to do stuff. There's that cubby cleaning out. It's winter time, they have a bunch of stuff and they're trying to pack it all out. And the cubby is the last thing that really gets attention. Um, so they're very honest. So the data show that, you know, they've shown improvements in the morning when they arrive and what they're doing. Um, they recognize what they're doing well and what they need to work on. And they need a way to remember it without adult intervention because otherwise it defeats the purpose. You know, they're trying to gain responsibility, gain um, that independence. And implementation can be difficult, like at the end of the day when it's time to clean cubbies and they're trying to get all the major stuff. 
Um, so we had to come up with a plan. Um, so they decided, I put this data, I said, here's what we're seeing, here's what you're seeing, what should we do? And so they decided that they wanted checklists so they could self-monitor. So now they have all of those um, metrics on a little checklist. And here's student filling it out. I just, she was doing that, I didn't tell her to do it. She was totally doing it, I just snapped a picture. And you can see that one student felt particularly, <laughs> that feels really fantastic. And uh, yes, now two sharpened pencils, it's really great. Um, and so we have made progress towards a silent day. These are the current student-led activities um, that I can, I could be out of the room and it would still happen. Um, math station, there is a teacher station, um, but other than that, if they're not with the teacher at the station, they're choosing their own independent work from the math menu and they're off and making their own decisions. Um, and they did um, have a silent morning in October. I said nothing and they did everything. And if there's time, I will show you a little video clip of that, the beginning and end of the morning meeting which is what I was able to capture. And just how seriously they took that. They took the responsibility so seriously and they were better behaved on that day getting from the classroom to the music than I think they ever have been in the hallway because they knew that it was up to them. It was their responsibility. Um, so they were really very proud of themselves and they did a good job. And so um, that leads us to our next steps. So I to assess the student to ratio um, talk to make sure that their voices are heard much more often than mine. Like, right, if they're going to take control, they need to have that. Um, and the, determining what responsibilities they can have, like as far as academic work, anything else, I'd ask them for input. Um, they, they were very interesting, wrote things like, we need to be respectful of each other, and we need to, you know, which is all great, it's all great, but I was like, okay, well, what about that academic part? And they said, oh, well, maybe we should have some things teach some lessons, we could have them teach with you, we could have, you know. So they came up with all sorts of great ideas. Now it's just giving them those opportunities. And we have a plan for a silent afternoon, and it's going to be on the next Friday that we don't have skiing and a ski program in our school. And they chose Friday afternoon because they thought it was logical that because there are three chunks of time and mostly it's student directed now, so that's a good time to practice. Um, so that's our plan going forward and then mm -hmm.